So there are some moments in your life when you have to pause a moment and go, exactly how did I get here? And one such moment was when I was stood at the top of a tank. It was a fish tank full of enormous two metre long eels. The tank was the size that you could comfortably fit a semi-detached three bedroom house into. It was enormous. And I couldn't quite work out how I got here. <laughs> this was completely outside of my normal experience. And then out of the tank popped Robert Llewellyn in a full um, Victorian diver's equipment helmet. And that was part of being our Scrappy Challenge. I was on nine different episodes. And so a week later, I was on an entirely different tank, shooting rockets into the sky. <laughs> it was quite a weird and bizarre experience. So what I'm going to talk about is how I actually ended up on such a programme and what it was like uh, being on it and also what sort of things I learned from it because it was a really um, exciting and uh, quite technically challenging uh, experience and it sort of shaped me as a person. So hopefully most of you know what I'm talking about. It was of course a programme that was put on Channel 4 and they still show it every now and again. I, I suspect they've stopped showing it now because it was a very long time ago that we actually recorded the first episode. Now, some of you may have remembered the first episode. It was um, it was how to build a hovercraft. So the, the aim was to build a hovercraft in one day. We had um, basically from dawn to the original concept was you had from dawn to dusk. And the first, the pilot that was actually Team of five, a, a team of five on each side, and you had to build this whole craft on a scrap heap and then test it at the end of the day to see who would win. And this is how I got involved because I was the expert on the pilot episode. I had at that time been racing hovercraft for about 10 years or more. Um, it was 1997, so it was an enormous long time ago. Obviously, I was only 12 or something. No, no, I was 26 at the time, so still quite young. Um, but by that time, as I say, I'd been racing hovercraft and building hovercraft, so could quite happily build, rebuild an engine in a field or do some glass fibering. Not a problem. I had a degree in automotive engineering, so I kind of knew a bit about stuff. But it's scrappy took things to another level. The first episode, the pilot, quite honestly, was was quite poor. It was quite rubbish. Um, it was supposed, it was sort of a, a Mad Max-esque um, theme. Later on, of course, they went all fine. Um, but it, they didn't really uh, know what they were doing. The production company was a very small uh, production company now. They're one of the biggest in the world partly in due uh, to the success of, of Scrappy. <laughs> um, and so um, we'll sort of gloss over that episode a bit. But at the end of it, it was a really tough day. Um, but at the end of it, we've, I sort of thought, I know I can do better than this. Um, and so when they phoned me up saying, would you like to be uh, the team captain on the first series? I was quite keen to do this. The first series, there were just two teams. Um, of four. We had a different expert every week. Um, but I was on one team and I had Bowser and Shen as my teammates. We were put together. We didn't know each other beforehand. And then Dick Strawbridge was the team captain on the other team. And I suspect, I think this is the first time he'd actually been on TV. And I remember uh, when we went in to film that first episode of the first series, there were six programmes. And uh, I was walking through uh, the scrap heap, which, you know, vaccine, which was very salubrious. You know, it was a scrap heap and there were porter cabins everywhere. And so she indicated into the costume porter cabin where Dick Strawbridge was there. But he was just getting changed. So he was standing there with his trousers around his ankles. And the producer said to me, and this here is Major Dick. Because, of course, he was in the army. So I had this vision of Dick Strawbridge with his trousers around the ankle. Oh, 
Hello, uh, Major Dick. Good, good to meet you. So then, of course, we had to um, build what they say you're going to build. Now, in those days, we literally only had one day for most of the builds. You can tell which ones we had to build in a day because the testing is all done at night because we'd always sort of overrun. It was supposed to finish at dusk. In reality, quite often we overran and the darker it gets, the later you can tell that we overran. And so quite a few of them were filmed. Um, but like I say, by the testing um, was getting very late in the night. And in fact, I think the tractor pullers, we finished about four o'clock in the morning. And so it was a real sort of um, test. You'd start in the morning and the first thing you would do, it would be about 10ish or something like that. They'd take your watches off so you would never know what time it was. And the first thing you had to do was the only real, what I call true filming in the whole thing, which is where you'd have to walk through the scrap heap. We'd at that point have only just met the expert. We had no idea what we were gonna build that day. And they'd tell us to walk through the scrap heap. And we'd have to walk through the scrap heap about 14 times. Because, of course, they wanted the wide shot. And then they wanted the close-up shot. And, oh, actually, could we have a shot now of you walking through the puddles? We'd like some close-up shots of your feet, please. And so we'd do all of this. And meanwhile, the assistant director was shouting at us, remember, it's war. Look tough. And so would be walking through the scrapyard trying to look tough and then Bowser would be there going because we hadn't been on the scrap heap for you know a few days and there'd be different things and he'd go oh I, I think we're doing something watery this week because there's lots of sort of water there's lots of sort of waterproofing or you know the on the week of the uh, tractor pullers, it goes, it's something big, because we could see there was a whole lot more sort of bigger stuff on the scrap heap. And the way it would work is obviously the expert knew what we were building. Um, and the expert would have been discussing, um, you know, for, for weeks and maybe even months beforehand what we were going to build. And so they'd have written basically a shopping list and given it to the production company and go, this is what I need. Because, you know, you'd never find a whole crashed microlight that you can build a hovercraft from on, on a normal scrap heap. And also, um, they'd have to make sure that the engines worked. And so they would buy, you know, an old scrap uh, Sierra or something when we did the tractor pullers, and they would have had to have tested them and made sure that they worked. And then they were put on the scrap heap. We'd still have to go and find them. I mean, sometimes we could never find the bits. That last one tractor wheel for the tractor puller was hidden somewhere underneath the skip. And we were looking for hours for that until someone from the production crew went, why don't you look in that skip over there? On occasion, we even had to do the few uh, negotiating with the other team. I don't suppose you need all of those wheels that you've got there. Um, and so there was a bit of a plan, but it was essentially um, a scrap heap. And sometimes, you know, you would find all sorts of different things um, over the different episodes. Uh, obviously, the first six episodes that we did for the first series were all on the same scrap heap. But I did a few other episodes later and they were on different scrap heaps and gradually things got better. Um, we had to work initially. The ground was very rough. It was very difficult. Say you're making something with a chassis. You want everything to be level. And if you're on rough ground and outside and it starts dipping down with rain, it's like, oh, dear me. But there were some good things being on the scrap heap as well. I mean, one of the amazing things was all the DeWalt tools. We had... Um, one guy who came from DeWalt and he would just unpack like all the tools and put them on the tool rack. And we would just start drawing going, oh, look at all these lovely DeWalt tools. These are, you know, we had the whole range. So it was amazing. Um, I haven't many times got recognized after Scrappy. Occasionally, there's a bit of a niche market. 
But one time, a few years later, I walked into the DeWalt engineering office at their factory. I was working as a bearing application engineer at the time. And so I'd walked in there with a sales engineer. And it was a strange feeling walking in there because I'd walked in many engineering offices. But what happened when I walked in there that time was there was this sort of murmur that sort of evaporated out around the office because obviously they'd been watching carefully because all of their tools were there. And they'd even, I think they'd black, it was linked with Black and Decker. So they, I think they'd even put in a team as well. And uh, I've never quite gotten such a response as walking in their office, which was quite weird. But some of the builds were amazing. We started off the first series building off-road vehicles. Again, I think we were still finding our feet because, as I say, they'd put me in a team with these two guys. And what you probably can't tell from the TV was just how tall they were. Bowser was ex-army and was on in the uh, diplomatic police, so he could carry a gun. And he was well over six foot, so he was an imposing person. And Shen also was also over six foot. I was wearing platform heels, so I didn't look quite so short, but they were enormous blokes. And they'd been given this 26 year old to tell them what to do. And so it was quite interesting from a team dynamics um, on whether they were actually going to do what I said. But our side tended to work very much um, as a democracy. And you can see that on some of the episodes. Whereas Dick's team, he was an army major and he told them what they were doing. And so there was this interesting uh, group dynamics. And every morning when we were told what we were going to do, we'd all go, oh, my God, we've got to build this. And a part of that was for the TV cameras. <laughs> but part of it was also that enormous like, oh, my God. How am I going to build a tractor puller or a medieval catapult? And I have no idea how to build a rocket or a pneumatic walking machine. What are we going to do? And so I remember being, I'd have sort of butterflies in my stomach, absolute terrible stomach pain. And they'd tell us what they were going to do. And the first thing that would happen was the two guys would go off on the quad bike into the scrap heap. And I'd be left there with the expert who, like I say, we'd only just met. And he'd be going, right, come on, we've got to, got to do this. And I would go, no, let's just sit here for five minutes. This is the only time today you're going to get five minutes to sit down and relax. Now I would try and take a deep breath and stop the butterflies from overwhelming me. It was good to have a moment of pause. When we're in the middle of chaos and we're in the middle of a project and we don't quite know what's going to happen, it's very easy for us just to run around looking busy. But if there's one thing that I learned on Scrappy, that was the builds that we built best were the ones where we all knew where we were going. And so sometimes taking five minutes just to stop and think and go, where are we going, was really important. So the ones where we didn't really know where we were going, like the pneumatic walking machine, we quite, I don't think any of us in the team, except the expert, had ever worked with pneumatics. We didn't quite understand how this walking machine was going to work. And so that was probably one of our longest, most difficult builds. Whereas the tractor puller, oh, the tractor puller was wonderful. I mean, in many ways, it was quite a big uh, build. We had, a, we had a V6 Rover engine. So it was an enormous sort of powerful machine. But within the first hour, we'd found the engine. Our expert was amazing. He built his first 
tractor pulling in about eight days. And so he was a sort of expert you wanted on your team. And we'd managed to support it off an engine hoist. And so within the first hour, we'd got the engine running. We'd found a front axle and, and just placed that in front of the engine. And we kind of looked at each other and went, ah, we're nearly there. Not that much more to do. And that vision of where we were going really drove that project forward. We understood where we were going. But one of the other things that I also learned there was that sometimes you've got this project and it's like an enormous bowl of spaghetti. And somehow you've got to sort your bowl of spaghetti out. And there's all these threads and you just don't know where you're going to start. And so part of doing something like a big project like that was sometimes, A, you have to know where you're going. But B, sometimes you have to then step away from that and go, yes, but what's the first thing I need to do? And concentrate on that one thing and not worry about the rest of it. You know where the rest of it's going to go. But it's doing that one thing and concentrating on that one thing. And sometimes it was the only thing that sort of stopped you just running around in a headless chicken type way. It's going, well, I know how to do this one thing. And then I know how to do the next one thing. And the third. And hopefully, by the end of it, you've managed to break this enormous sort of project down into individual parts. And when you're working as a team, it's quite good if you do the bits you know someone has also done the bits that they knew which hopefully wasn't the same as you knew and eventually it all comes together and that's basically how we sort of tackled it but some of the projects were really um like i say quite scary projects i remember when we did the speedboat the expert, no, it was the judge afterwards said to me, why did you not go faster on the test? Why on earth? He could have, he was really quite capable. He was right. The boat was more capable than I did it. However, I'd never driven a boat before. I'd never had a practice to drive that boat before because crew were so worried that everything would fall apart because everything was cobbled together. We used to weld the drive shafts onto the end of the engine. And of course, this would fry all the electrics. <laughs> we lived and we learned. And so on this speedboat, the prop shaft had been welded on, but it was a two or three meter long prop shaft. And it hadn't been welded on straight. And the only thing between me and the prop shaft was an aluminium ladder. And I could see this prop shaft starting to wobble all over the place. And as I say, I worked as an engineer. I knew we weren't supposed to run shafts when they're above their vibrating speed. <laughs> this was a dangerous thing to do. And so it was all very well, the expert who was standing safely on a cliff high up going why didn't you go faster but he wasn't sitting on top of a vibrating prop shaft having never driven a boat before which didn't steer very well it's of course only later many years later that i found out that actually if i had gone faster the boat would have steered better but of course the boat didn't have brakes either and it's all very well when it's not you on top of that prop shaft. But the tractor puller, they said originally it was going to be me driving the tractor puller. And Bowser and everyone else seemed quite happy about this. This will be fine, no problem. Yeah, you carry on. Yeah, 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 no problem. And then they said, well, no, actually, maybe we'll, we'll get Dave and Bowser to, to drive. And, you know, because we had the captain driving the other day. We'll, we'll have the next, you know, second in command doing it. And so once he found that out, Bowser started welding in more patches, um, sort of just, just below his seat. And I said to him, oh, it was fine. It was perfectly safe when I was going to drive it. <laughs> but now you're 
bother driving it. You want these extra bits. And so I think it's very easy to say, oh, it's fine, it's fine. But when it's your, what sits on the line, then uh, suddenly, yeah. <laughs> and so I, th I suspect, really, uh, one of the things uh, that possibly uh, was uh, that they had to bring in is that they realised they needed a lot more health and safety. And so, although we did a lot of our tests on the same day, later on, I became I was the judge in the fifth series, which was again hovercraft. And so, what they had then was they had a build day, and then they had a test. Uh, they had a, no, what they called it, a, a safety day, and then they had a test day. So it was spread over three days. But this safety day, essentially, it was a day to make sure that the machines were safe, and they'd add in things like safety cutouts and things like that. But really, it was also a day where they could finish things off. And so uh, <laughs> I, I feel later on they had a bit more. Uh, it wasn't quite. As, uh, as, as sort of, you know, we really had to do it in one day. Uh, and that really, it made me realise just how much more we are capable of, is that when you're put in a situation where you have to do something and everyone's watching, oh, and we're going to film it so the nation can see, is that when you step up to the plate and have to do something, is that sometimes you realise you're capable of far, far more than you ever thought possible. And I think that's one of the key things that I learned from Scrappy Challenge. So many things, many, many things that I learned. But hopefully um, you've also learned a few things today. So anyway, I shall hand you back over to Sam. Okay, well, thanks very much, Anne. Um, so Thank we've got you. a question from Lewis. Uh, what was your favourite episode? Um, I quite enjoyed the rockets. Um, we had to build these these rockets, um, and then we went and tested it. We had to stand on, um, you know, tanks in a in a tank place, you know, while we were uh, thing. Um, but also the catapults one, the medieval catapults, was amazing, and that's probably the one episode that has inspired uh, many people. Um, for example, you know, uh, before that episode, um, they hadn't built the one at Warwick Castle um, and they hadn't done, you know, like um, they did that enormous one, didn't they, that threw cars and things. So I think that was also quite an amazing episode. We just saw Dick Strawbridge's, you know, uh, one that sort of appear over the top of the wall and we just went, my God, it's like a dinosaur or something like that has appeared. So that that was also quite fun to do as well. Oh, sounds yeah. great. Um, so I've got one other question from Brad about uh, what is your involvement with 3D Crowd? Um, yeah, so good question. So what I do now is I run a Fab Lab. So hopefully uh, you understand what Fab Lab is. It's a place where people can come and make things. Um, and so we have lots of equipment like 3D printers, laser cutters, PNC machines and things. So my job is to show people how to make things. Um, which, you know, links in nicely with having done all the scrap heap things. So I get loads of people walking in the door and go, I want to make something mad. And I go, yeah, sure. No problem. You know, compared to a medieval cap hole, this is <laughs> no problem. And so um, when we heard about doing the visors, um, I I off work. Well, I'm working from home at the moment, which is not really that much working. But anyway, so I went and rescued the 3D printers, pulled them back here. Um, and I basically set up um, we got about three or four 3D printers. Um, that I've managed to set up and uh, I've been printing the visors. 